They make it look easy. Soaring effortlessly in the air or diving headfirst into the dark, frothy sea, the northern gannet seems equally at home in both air and water. As the stiff wind keeps them aloft, they eye the movement of fish some 100 feet below them. When the moment is just right, they turn their flight downward. They fold their six-foot-long wings in at just the last moment, transforming their bodies into a feathered dart that pierces the water's surface. Whether it's a couple of birds or hundreds, the diving gannets are a sight to behold. It's hard not to stare. It's hard not to be awestruck by their fishing prowess, by their elegance, in the dangerous way they make their living. A gannet's dive may be relatively shallow, or as deep as 72 feet. They turn their graceful flight into a kind of aquatic flying, their wings and feet propelling them into the liquid realm of submarine as they pursue schooling fish. Northern gannets are the largest gannet in the family Sulidae and are known as Morris basanus. Their cousins include the Cape Gannet of Southern Africa, the Australasian gannet of southern Australia, Tasmania, and New Zealand, and various species of boobies who inhabit the warmer waters around the equator. But the northern gannet is a lover of cold weather, hugging both sides of the North Atlantic, preferring to stay close to the continental shelf than hanging out over deep water. This is where their prey is the most plentiful. They spend much of their life at sea and breed in fewer than 40 places in the world. Their breeding grounds are typically uninhabited and remote, sometimes little more than an island of rock with steep, jagged cliffs. Their colonies, known as gannetries, are found in places along the Gulf of St. Lawrence and Quebec, the coasts of Newfoundland and Iceland, the islands around Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and Germany. They are also found along the coast of Norway and even Russia's northern Kola Peninsula. Each year, hundreds of thousands of birds come to the seaside cliffs to nest. The island of Bass Rock off the coast of Scotland hosts up to 150,000 birds. It may appear as if the rock is covered in snow, but it isn't. It's the gannets. I can only imagine what it would be like to hear the sound of that many birds. The gannets are nothing short of stunningly beautiful, and when they dive, it leaves the viewer breathless. Their eyes are more forward-facing than many other seabirds, giving them binocular vision and excellent depth perception. This allows them to see fish while soaring above in the air and after they enter the water. But this raises the question, how are they able to see well in both environments? Let's approach this from how our human eyes work. When most humans open their eyes underwater, the result is blurry vision, and here's why. Our eyes are made to focus on a specific angle of light. We have a domed cornea and a somewhat flattened lens. When light travels through water, the light is refracted or bent, resulting in blurry vision. Gannets, on the other hand, have flatter corneas in a nearly spherical lens. Research suggests that when a gannet dives, the muscles that hold the lens in place squeeze the lens and push it forward against the iris, causing it to bulge through the pupillary opening. This increases its refractive abilities, giving it sharp vision underwater. Equally as impressive is that the gannet is able to make these transitions instantaneously. So now the big question. They can dive from 100 feet above the water at speeds of up to 60 miles per hour. How do they do this without injuring themselves? To put this into perspective, an Olympic platform diver hits the water going about 30 to 35 miles per hour. For a gannet, the pressures exerted upon their bodies are tremendous, and the dive has to be executed perfectly if it is to avoid fatality. The answer lies within understanding gannet hydrodynamics and anatomy. Most of us have at some point experienced a painful belly flop when jumping into a swimming pool. We meet the force created by the water's surface tension with immediate deceleration. For the gannet, its sharp pointed bill pierces the water's surface creating little to no deceleration. After this initial impact, an air cavity is created surrounding the bird's head like a bubble. The head continues to decelerate while the body is still accelerating, increasing the forces of compression around the head and neck. 
The muscles that are bundled around these structures contract to lock the vertebrae in place until the chest hits the water, which marks the end of the compression phase. This anatomical adaptation has limits, and as long as the gannet stays within its acceptable diving speeds, it will remain unharmed by the dive. They also have air sacs in the head and neck which act like airbags, providing a cushion when they make impact with the water. Their eyes have strong nictitating membranes. This is a translucent membrane, or third eyelid, that provides protection for the eye while still allowing them to see. They can hold their breath for 30 to 45 seconds while they pursue their favorite fish, such as herring, mackerel, sardines, anchovies, smelt, and pollock. Sometimes they hunt in tandem with a pod of dolphins who bring the schools of fish closer to the surface. If you look closely at a gannet, you'll notice that there's no evidence of the bird's nares, or what we would think of as nostrils. So how, and from where, does it breathe? If it had external nares, it would be at risk of having salt water forced into its respiratory system when it hits the water. So instead, nature relocated the breathing apparatus to a safer place. The bony structures at the sides of the bill where it meets the head create a slight opening. It's basically breathing out of the sides of its mouth when not underwater. The bone that creates this is not rigidly attached to the skull, so when the bird hits the water with force, the bone acts as a shutoff valve, closing the gap. The gannet's feathers are waterproof. They emerge from the sea completely dry, with drops of water rolling off their backs like rain on a freshly waxed car. This is all thanks to the waxy substance secreted by the uropygial gland, or oil gland, at the base of their tail. When the birds preen themselves, they distribute this waxy substance over their feathers, allowing them to stay dry when they dive. Northern gannets are able to breed when they are four to five years of age. They mate for life, each are coming to the breeding grounds to renew the bond with their existing mate. It remains a mystery how they find each other among the thousands of other gannets. They greet each other with a display of shaking their heads, bowing, calling, and bill fencing. The male builds the nest, forming a compressed, cup-shaped mound of mud, algae, feathers, grass, and excrement, sometimes placed dangerously close to the edge of the cliff. They frequently use bits of plastic and other human objects they find in the sea, as well as fishing netting, though, sadly, this sometimes leads to entanglement of adults and chicks. The female lays a single, all-white egg. Instead of using a brood patch, which is a bare patch of skin on their bellies to incubate the egg, they use their highly vascular webbed feet to keep the egg warm. After about 45 days, the chick hatches and will remain in the care of the parents for the next three months. Both the male and female work tirelessly to provide their growing chick with food. They take turns with one parent staying at the nest and the other heading out to the sea to hunt. Life in the colony is noisy and crowded. Both the male and female protect the nest and their chick from other gannets, using threat displays such as lunging and jabbing their powerful bills. The young gannet comes into the world with quite a challenge before it. Having never left the nest, one day it heads to the edge of the cliff and launches itself on its inaugural flight. Now, it's worth mentioning that at this point, the chick far outweighs its parents. It also doesn't have the muscular strength to fly very well, having never done it before. Once airborne, the chick flies erratically a quarter to a half mile until it lands in the sea. They have sufficient fat reserves to last them one to two weeks while they build their flight muscles and learn to fish. It's an absolute trial by fire. They lack the strength to fly back to their nest, so this is it. It's full commitment into the world at this point. The juvenile will take about four years to reach its adult plumage. Each year, it takes on a new appearance, gradually replacing its sooty brown feathers for more of the coloring of an adult. The way these birds live is nothing short of extreme. Their high-speed dives, the places they nest, the unforgiving pass-or-fail transition into independence. I have never seen gannets in real life, but would love to someday. If you have seen them, I would be interested in hearing what your experience was like. Feel free to leave a comment down below. 
Thank you for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.